Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Franklin, and I'm president of the Cancer Support Community. For more than 35 years, we at the Cancer Support Community have been a relentless ally for anyone impacted by cancer. We help individuals manage the realities of this disruptive disease and get back to their normal. Whether accessing our free services in person at one of our 175 locations across the country, online, or overall our toll-free helpline, which is open seven days a week, you are getting a team of licensed professionals providing patient navigation, financial counseling, genetic counseling, pediatric support, and much more. So today's topic, there have been some really important and game-changing developments in cancer diagnosis and treatment over the last few years. That's why we've decided to host a two-part series, because this is pretty complex and incredibly interesting, where we explore the ways cancer care has evolved to more personalized medical care and why it's so important for you to be sure that your cancer is fully understood before you begin treatment. Today's conversation is focused on the importance of testing. So we're going to talk about receiving the appropriate biomarker testing, and you may hear us say genomic, but um, I, I'm sure Andrea will speak to the fact that, that we say biomarker testing and how to use the information you learn as you make treatment decisions, um, including decisions about participating in a clinical trial. So I'm thrilled to bring you today's conversation in partnership with our friends and our incredible experts from the Longevity Foundation and the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. So I will introduce them and then we will start the conversation. So Andrea Ferris is president and CEO of the Lon Longevity Foundation. The Longevity Foundation is one of the preeminent lung cancer organizations focused on improving outcomes for people with lung cancer through research, education, policy initiatives, and support and engagement for patients, survivors, and caregivers. The Longevity Foundation seeks to make an immediate impact on quality of life and survivorship for everyone touched by the disease while promoting health equity by addressing disparities throughout the care continuum. And our friend Lynn Matrizian is Chief Science Officer at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. She brings extensive experience and passion for cancer research combined with business training to provide strategic direction for the scientific, excuse me, scientific aspects of the initiatives and activities within the scientific and medical affairs team towards the goal of improving outcomes for those facing panc pancreatic cancer. She was the founding chair at the Department of Cancer Biology in the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt University, the president of the American Association for Cancer Research, and a special assistant to the director of the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. So welcome to both of our friends and experts today. I'm really excited to, to have you join us. And I also want to extend our gratitude to LabCorp Oncology for bringing you this important Facebook Live. So. Let's get into it. And I want to start with the basics, because like I said, this can be a really complex um, topic, but one that is so critical for anyone diagnosed with cancer to, to really understand. So Andrea, I want to start with you. When you think about genomic testing, biomarker testing, precision medicine, what does that mean and why should patients be interested? So we at Longevity define precision medicine as biomarker driven care, and it's along the entire cancer continuum. It could be from before you're diagnosed for risk stratification for screening purposes. It could be once you are diagnosed for either a neoadjuvant, so before surgery or adjuvant, so after surgery um, to determine your therapeutics or your risk of recurrence. And then I think where most people hear about it right now is in the advanced stage setting to help determine um, treatment options, uh, in, in so which is hugely important at diagnosis, but it's also really important at progression or at recurrence to have for precision medicine. So we, we view it as precision um, biomarker driven care, which obviously is determined through comprehensive biomarker testing. And mm -hmm. we don't refer to it as genomic testing uh, internally. And I think because biomarker testing takes it up a level because not everything now, at least in you know, some diseases like lung cancer, it's not genomic, it's protein based. And so we need to be sure to be advocating for the right thing 
and to be using the right words when describing what this important testing is. Um, and it really helps you make your best treatment decision with your healthcare team in order if what's right for you. That's great, Andrea. Thank you. And I wanted to make sure that we hit on that biomarker piece. And I know Lynn did as well. So that was a really helpful explanation. So Lynn, can you help us understand the difference between genetic and genomic testing? Yeah, sure. So let's, um, how about a little refresher course in, in biology? And we'll start with when we started as a human being, we had genes from our mother and genes from our father. And that's the unique, um, you know, mix of genes that make us us. Um, so that those genes, which are made, which are DNA, our DNA, our DNA blueprint is in every cell of our body. So that's when you do genetic testing, that's what you're looking at, that DNA. And you can look in any cell of your body and know what is the constitution of those genes that, that is your basic DNA blueprint. Now, when cancer occurs, a cell goes rogue. So there are changes that occur in that cell, be it in the lung, be it in the pancreas, being it wherever that cancer arises. And that DNA can change. And you can get alterations in that DNA that are specific only to that cancer. They're not found in every cell of the body. So the real difference and what, what sometimes hard to keep straight is that some when we're talking in this case about genetic testing, we're talking about the genes you were born with. When we're talking about genomic or biomarker testing, a lot of times what then we're specifically talking about what the makeup, the DNA makeup or any of the um, changes that happen in the tumor cell itself. And that requires looking at a piece of the tumor in order to understand that. And as, as Andrea was saying, there's information in there that can help us know how to treat that tumor because we've learned something about its particular makeup. Great, Lynn. Thank you. That's incredibly helpful because I think a lot of times the average person may confuse genetic testing, genomic testing, and then we throw in this idea of biomarker testing. What about the concept of, of profiling? Is that any different? Is that a word that people should, should know? What do you think about that? Lynn, yeah, I'll, I'll so go. You want me to answer? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yep. Yep. Um, Yes, yeah, so it, molecular profiling is a kind of a broad term that's used often, and it's usually used in the context of genomic testing, tumor testing itself. So a lot of times people will say, you know, get your tumor molecularly profiled, and that means let's understand what are the molecules that are different in that tumor that could be driving the tumor because if we understand what's driving the tumor, what made that tumor cell different than the normal cell, then maybe we have drugs that can reverse that effect. And that's really what we're looking for. Great, thank you, that's, that's super helpful. And when we talk about um, both genomic testing and genetic testing, and this is a question for either one of you, can you help sort of the patient who's going in understand what that testing process would be like? Sure. Um, I, you know, I can't speak to the genetic testing because lung cancer right now doesn't have an inherited component, which is really where most of the genetic testing comes in. Um, so we really, it, it really is the comprehensive biomarker or the genomic testing that happens. Um, and so for solid tumors, of which lung cancer is one of them, most of the time it requires a biopsy. So the extraction of a piece or the entire tumor, if it's early stage, that then can be sent off to a lab for analysis. Um, on a, on so, in some circumstances, and if the tissue is not available, um, there are starting to be what people might know of as liquid biopsies or blood-based biopsies that can be performed as well. However, I think it's still sort of the gold standard to try to use the tissue-based diagnosis first. Um, Lynn, I don't know if you can talk to the genetic part. Um, we don't have that in lung cancer. 
Yep, yep, and we do in, in pancreatic cancer. So um, very much like lung cancer, we do the, the biomarker testing of the tumor itself, and we think that's very important. Um, but there is also the, the new guidelines say that everyone with pancreatic cancer should have genetic testing. And the reason is because there are inherited genes that predispose to pancreatic cancer. And some of those genes predispose to other cancer types as well. Um, the, the famous ones are the BRCA genes, which predispose to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and it turns out pancreatic cancer. Um, and so we now recommend that, um, that every person who's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer understands whether they have a genetic predisposition to that cancer. And that's important for two reasons. One, it's important for them. There are certain drugs that have been FDA approved for people who have some of these alterations in all their DNA, in their inherited DNA. And so it's important for treatment, but then it's also important to understand the risk of family members of that individual that has pancreatic cancer. So if the person would turn out to have one of these predisposition genes, then you would want to test their siblings, their children, um, other family members to see whether they would um, be at higher risk or not. And the difference is you're either at higher risk or you're at absolutely normal risk. So you, you really want to know um, what the, what those genes are telling you. And I'm so glad that we asked about, um, that we had both of you on today to talk about both lung cancer and pancreatic cancer so you can see the difference and that patients can understand. It really depends on the type of cancer you have to whether you should get genetic testing, genomic testing, and what you should know going into those appointments. So I'm glad that we clarified that. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of clarifying, Andrea, I'm going to ask you to, to try and clarify things as we get even more complex. So um, looking at different types of biomarker testing, some may have heard terms like next generation sequencing or multi-gene panels or, or other things. What are the different tests and what determines which one that a specific patient might have and when? So I can't really speak to the what a specific patient might have and when in lung cancer. Um, so people might also hear of single analyte tests, single gene tests, and so forth. So in, in our disease, that could be an ALK mutation, an EGFR mutation, a ROS1 mutation, and other things like that. And when we started to really learn about the disease, and it has been just an exponential pace with which this learning has happened, but when it first started down the precision medicine path, there really were only one or two or three driver mutations. So people could test for one at a time, right? Um, and you would test for one. And if it wasn't that, you would test for the other. What started happening, though, is now we have there are at least nine drugs available, FDA approved, that have distinct driver mutations. You can't take a very small piece of tissue and test it for nine different things sequentially. So in lung cancer and in other diseases where we are going down a really deep precision medicine path and understanding the drivers, and it's a very heterogeneous disease as well, which is also the complexity of it, you need to do a multi-analyte test. So really test for multiple of these driver mutations at the, or biomarkers or fusion at the same time. And that could be either on a multi-gene panel, a multi-analyte panel, all the way up to a full next gen sequencing, which is really just a very complex and, and bigger panel for multiple genes. They test up to 500 different ones. Um, what determines whether a patient, it gets next gen sequencing or a 10 gene panel or a 50 gene panel, that's really up to the ordering physician. It's up to their healthcare system. Sometimes it's the insurance and the payers, sadly to say, that drive that decision. Um, but at a minimum, that what people need to know is that they should at a minimum be tested for whatever is in the NCCN guidelines and hopefully more because there are, again, in our disease, a lot of clinical trials that are available. And often those clinical trials are now first line. It's not a second or a third or a treatment of last resort. It's the first treatment a person can get. 
and it's often best care. And But if you're not tested for that mutation or that biomarker, you don't know that you may be eligible for that, yeah. um, that clinical Thanks, trial. Thanks, Andrea. And, and just to clarify, so folks know NCCN, National Com Comprehensive Cancer Network. So they yes, sorry, develop the guidelines for cancer care. I encourage folks to go to their website. They also have patient-friendly guides, so you can learn yes. more about what types of, of cancer treatments are available and, and best practice for your type of cancer. Yes. Um, Lynn, would you add anything to the, the concept around next-gen sequencing or multi-gene panels? Yeah, so we're, um, we're a, a little bit different in pancreatic cancer than in lung cancer in that the mutations that we're looking for are a little more rare. Usually, they, they, some of them only occur in 1% or less of the individuals with pancreatic cancer. At the most, maybe it's 5%. I mean, so we're looking at very small subpopulations, but when you add them together, you come up to, to maybe as much as 20% of pancreatic cancer would benefit from precision medicine. So we tend to like those very large gene panels. We tend to like them because we're, um, we get as much information as we can um, from that tumor. Um, and it's not as easy for us to make a specific panel to look at very specific things in pancreatic cancer because we're, we're looking for a whole bunch of little different things. Um, but it's um, so, and luckily there's, there are lots of those that are now available and we can get all that information with one, with one test. It's really pretty amazing. Yeah. And what about with, with time, as we have these multi-gene panels, these big panels, as science evolves and we learn more about cancer and personalized medicine, can that be helpful for patients who have taken one of those bigger panel tests? So we're always, we're continually looking for new drugs to target those specific alterations. Um, you know, there's a, a world of um, both basic science and then Phar pharmaceutical science that are designing drugs that will, in essence, turn off the activity of those genes that have gone rogue um, and that are doing activities that they're not supposed to. Um, and so as we continually put those drugs into our repertoire, um, there the FDA has started to recognize tumor agnostic approvals for drugs. So it doesn't matter whether it came from the lung or the pancreas, if it has this specific mutation that you can try this drug. Um, and so that really opens up this opportunity to, to find drugs that might be effective for individuals if you, if you do the test and if you um, look for those different alterations. So I do think that um, the number of people who will benefit from this will only grow and grow and grow as we have more drugs that are tested and then become a approved, particularly in this tumor agnostic or this kind of for, for all comers, if as long as they have that mutation. And when you say tumor agnostic, Lynn, you mean that um, one drug could actually work for different types of cancer? That's right. That drug right. could, if there is a an ALK mutation, as, as is sometimes find in lung cancer, if you happen to find a pancreatic cancer with an ALK mutation, you can use that drug. So it's, um, there is, yes, it's, it's independent of what um, organ, what tissue that tumor arose in. So it's about the mutation and not the tumor, or as, as Andrea said earlier, um, you know, we, there's, there's tumor, uh, solid tumors like lung cancer, there's also blood cancers, but it's more about the mutation and not the actual type of cancer. That's right. And just, just to be clear, Elizabeth, though, that's not for everything. There are only certain mutations yeah. for which and certain drugs for which that is the case. And so I just I don't want people to think that it's for any mutation. Yep, that's, that's a great right. point. And the science is evolving. So we say that today yes. and, and there could be future discoveries that that allow us to understand even more in the future. But I think it's a really good point, Andrea. And I want to come back to something you said, because I think it's really important for people to understand. You talked about the need um, for testing in the beginning when you're diagnosed with cancer, but also with progression. Can you talk about that a little bit more and, and tell us the difference between the two? Sure. And Lynn, please, uh, please pipe in with the scientific aspect of it. 
But uh, it's hugely important at diagnosis because to understand what's driving your particular cancer, because as Lynn said, there are many treatments now that could help to reverse that or stop it. Um, a lot of cancers are really smart and they figure out ways around it also. And so then you might be hearing um, some terms called resistance mutations or mechanisms of resistance, which are a new biomarker or an existing one that perhaps was not as pronounced when the first test was done that arise as your, your body and the cancer in your body learns how to live with the drugs that are being used to suppress it and they figure out ways of getting around it. So if your cancer progresses, it's really important, um, again, in some diseases and talk to your you know, healthcare provider, but to be tested again, to understand what's driving that progression or what's driving that new cancer, if it's a new cancer that springs up in, the, in its place. Um, so that then the, a, a more targeted drug could be given to you at that point in time. So in lung, we think it's hugely important at any time you're making a treatment decision or changing your treatments or making at that inflection point to either be tested again or to go back to your original test results to see if that has some other information in it for you. That's really helpful. Thanks, Andrea. Lynn, would you add anything to that? Or did Andrea get the science spot on, which I think she did? Yep. Oh, yep. 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 That's very good. Okay. That's really a good job, Andrea. Okay. Good. Um, and, and I want to, I want to, um, you know, talk about that moment, especially at diagnosis. And we hear that, you know, sometimes testing can take a little bit of time and that often, you know, coming from the cancer support community, that often increases distress in patients. If they're told, let's, let's wait, we need to test your tumor. It's going to give us important information, but why, why is that so important to wait for the test? So I can tell you, but Lynn, go ahead. Well, I think it's it's really important in in lung cancer. Yeah. Um, if I think in pancreatic cancer, um, it's we have no um, molecularly defined first line therapies. So it's usually second or third line <laughs> before. Um, you're really, I think that often that's what happens before you're really ready to, um, to know what, um, to know what drug to use based on the molecular profile. Um, a potential difference is these, these, um, genetic alterations that I was talking about, which are relevant in pancreatic cancer. If you already know that you have that genetic alteration, that may make a difference. But in general, the tumor alterations, the genomic alterations that we've been talking about are usually used a little bit later on. So we want people to get tested early on so they have that in their back pocket in case they need it um, as, they, as they go through their, um, through their journey and um, if in case they need another treatment. Did Elizabeth freeze? I think we lost Elizabeth. So why she did then, I'll, I'll go ahead and add some information with Maybe respect to, to so, Sorry, Elizabeth? Can you hear me? Now we can, yeah. Okay, sorry I about gonna, that. I was, I was just going to add some information with respect to lung cancer. And so we actually refer to it as the, the uh, testing to treatment gap, if you will, um, in terms of the lag. and. For us, it's, it's actually hugely important that if possible, and it's not always possible, sometimes if people have a very aggressive disease, they do need to be treated right away. But ordinarily, that two-week time frame is it's hugely important to wait, recognizing that it is very stressful and anxiety-ridden time. Um, but in, and also the, you know, the providers need to explain to patients and to people who are diagnosed why it's so important. And it's not just so that you can get your best treatment first and your best chance of treatment. There are some treatments that if you go on it and it's inappropriate for you, you might be prevented from going on one that, you know, at a later point in time, that is better for you. Um, a perfect example of this now, many doctors automatically defer to immunotherapy, which works for a lot of people, but not everybody. And if you have one of these driver mutations, Oftentimes, if you've been on immunotherapy, 
you can no longer take the drug because of the side effects and the, the interactions, and it, it could provide really, really bad adverse events for you. So the best drug for you, you have now cut off that ability to take um, because you didn't wait for your testing results. So for us, it's hugely important, um, albeit very stressful, and when possible to wait for the test results before making that treatment decision. So you can have a fully informed conversation with your healthcare team. Absolutely, Andrea, I, I appreciate that. And I think, um, you know, sometimes cancer patients feel like they're bombarded with so much information that it's hard to be able to sort through it. But when it comes to this, it's incredibly important for them to have access to that information so that when they do go and have a conversation with their provider, so when you talk to the patients that you work with, Andrea, and, and you're saying, okay, you're about to go have a conversation with your physician, um, can we talk about what that conversation looks like? You know, how should it flow? What kinds of questions should patients ask? And should clinical trials be a part of the questions that they ask their provider? Absolutely. And I think clinical trials should always be uh, a part of the conversation. And I think we just need to be somewhat careful. And Elizabeth, I'm sure you do the same thing, Lynn, the same is you know, how much is the responsibility of the patient versus how much is the responsibility of the healthcare system? As you said, you know, when you're diagnosed with any one of these diseases, it's a highly stressful, anxiety ridden time that you don't, you're already have all this terminology being thrown at you. You shouldn't have to advocate and request comprehensive biomarker testing. It's, it's guideline, it's malpractice not to do it, right? That said, there are a lot of people who still do need to ask for it. So I think from a, from a patient perspective in general is to ask your doctor, have I had comprehensive biomarker testing? What, is the, what does that tell us? What does it tell me about what treatments I should be on or what kind of disease do I have? If, um, you know, what about a clinical trial? It's not necessarily just a treatment of last resort. As we discussed, sometimes they may be best care in their first line. I think it's also a really good question to ask is this is great. And, you know, let's make a decision now, but what's next and what should I expect and what kind of conversations come next? And are there other treatments available for me? And if I take, if I go on this first treatment, is that changing what I potentially can go on later? Um, so I think there are a number of questions and a lot of our websites, yours, mine, Lynn, have questions that you should ask your doctor based on what type, you know, where you are in your treatment journey. Print them out, take them with you, um, look at them. If you're, not, if you're not in a frame of mind to do it, bring somebody with you who can ask these questions and write down the answers record the conversation or do it via FaceTime with somebody who can take notes for you. Um, so I think that there are a lot of things. And I, I think that um, some of it is, you know, on us as patient advocates to advocate on behalf of people so that they don't have to, you know, demand and get guideline adherent care. But some of it is the patient can ask those questions also. And don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion. That was going to be my next question, Andrea. So it's almost like we're in meetings together all the time when we talk about these things. <laughs> so I think, yeah, asking, I was talking to a friend recently, um, someone in her family has cancer and, and the, the family member was saying that she feels bad asking for a second opinion, right? She feels like it's feel going against your doctor. And, and what I said was every single cancer patient should ask for a second opinion. I don't care who you are and where you're being seen. And so I can tell from your head shakes that you feel that way too. Absolutely. And if, if you if you're worried about, you know, offending your doctor or if your doctor gets offended, run because you should be with a different doctor who doesn't get yeah. offended by it. Absolutely. If you Absolutely. can, not everybody can. Let's be realistic. Not everybody can and not everybody has those options. And, and that's a great point. And I also think I just want to put a plug in and granted, I'm biased because I'm a social worker. But but if you have access to a social worker, a nurse navigator, a patient yeah. navigator, if you don't within your your clinic system, call the cancer support community. We have navigators yeah. on our helpline. We have um, clinical trial specialists and nurses. We can we can help. But just like I know longevity and pan can you have folks who can who can provide information so that people can make these informed decisions. So even if you live in a community where you don't readily have access, there are plenty of supports like our organizations that can that can help. 
So I want to take a step back. We talked a little bit about clinical trials. And um, Lynn, as the scientist on the call today, I want to ask if in very simple terms, you can explain what a clinical trial is. And I know that in light of COVID, we've heard lots about clinical trials. So if you're talking to someone who knows nothing about a clinical trial, especially when we're talking about cancer, what do you tell them? So I think clinical trials break down into answering three questions. And the first, and because you're looking for a new drug, usually that's the clinical trials we're talking about is new drugs for treatments for a, a, a disease that, that you need to be treated for, um, for cancer. Um, and the first question is, is it safe? So am I, are you going to give me something, whether it's through a pill or through an infusion or something, are you going to give me something that is, um, that isn't going to kill me immediately or isn't going to make me go blind or is, I mean, you know, things that are really important, right? I mean, you really need to know, is it safe? Now that doesn't mean there aren't side effects. Um, and that, that will be evaluated with some of these drugs, but that basically you need to know, is it, is it safe? The second thing you need to know is, is it gonna work? Is it effective? Is it going to do what it's supposed to do, which is kill this cancer? And then the third one is, if you're going to make it widely available, is it better than what we what my other options? It's better than what we have otherwise. And those really make up the, the three questions that you ask in the three phases of clinical trials. A phase one clinical mm -hmm. trial asks if it's safe, a phase two clinical trial asks if it's effective, and a phase three clinical trial asks if it's better than what we have otherwise. And that's how we make advances. How are we going to know what's best for people unless we ask those questions and we try things that are new? And that I think sums up what I think a, a clinical trial is and people who, you know, thank you to all those people who go on clinical trials and help us learn um, how, how we can not only treat them, but how we can treat the next person who faces um, their disease. Absolutely. The, um, it's important for healthcare and a cancer patient's health, but I think sort of the civic engagement and making sure that, you know, all of these people are doing this and they're contributing to the health and well-being of, of future people and generations. It's such an important point. And Lynn, one thing you said I want to put a, an extra fine point on, you know, one of the questions we get a lot from patients is, um, will I be a guinea pig, right? And also, will I not receive any treatment? And I think when you talked about phase three, um, treatment as usual, you know, we are comparing sort of the standard of care to this new treatment, it is very rare for a cancer patient to receive a placebo because there are so many options these days. And so we often get that question from patients. And I just wanted to make sure that we hit on that, that that phase three, which is, is really the final trial before the, the medication goes to the public and is approved by the FDA, um, it usually almost always is against standard of care. Is that right? That's right. That's right. That that even though those are randomized trials and when you go into usually phase three trials are randomized, you go in, you may get standard of care. You may get standard of care plus the new treatment, but it will never be anything. It, it will always be the best that we have right now. The standard of care is the best that we have right now. We're seeing if the new thing can be better, but you'll never get less than the best that we have in a clinical trial. Thank you. I think that helps to allay one of the, the biggest fears from, from cancer patients. And, um, you know, it's, we talk about clinical trials quite a bit, but, and, and Andrea, this question is for you too. How does a patient find the right clinical trial, especially if we're talking about they've had their tumor tested and they need to find something specific? What do they do? Well, I know Pancan has a, has a great matching service and they, they run their own trials as well. Um, but uh, in general, you know, there's clinicaltrials.gov, which is comprehensive, but really not patient-centric. Um, it's tough to use. Um, and this is, this is assuming, uh, Elizabeth, that somebody wants to find something on their own, right? I mean, first step, obviously, is talk to your healthcare provider or your team about it. But if you also want to go do research on your own, 
Um, that's sort of the big, you know, NIH type of database of clinical trials. Um, there are also uh, organizations have um, clinical trial finder app. We have an actual tool that you can use that, that helps to digest and put in patient centric terms. Um, there are matching services as well, Emerging Med and others. Uh, some organizations you mentioned, you know, help to navigate you to a clinical trial as well. So I think there are a variety of steps that a person can take to both educate themselves as well as to talk to their providers about it. There are also um, all, a lot of patient groups where it's peer-to-peer -peer information sharing as well. Not always necessarily, you know, the best thing out there, but it is a, it is a source of information for you to then go and see if it may be right for you in talking with your doctor. Yeah, we hear all the time that patients, even if you're on sort of an online peer-to-peer -peer network or in a support group, you're going to listen to one another, whether it's about sure. what clinical trials are available, whether it's about side effects. I know, Lynn, you sure. mentioned that, you know, hearing the experience, but I'll, I'll I'll say that it's still important for patients to go to their doctor and say, hey, I have a friend who has pancreatic cancer. They said X, Y, and Z, but I want to confirm that. Can you help me understand that and make sure that the information that you're getting is right? Yep. So yep. and I I, really, I want to clarify um, in order biomarker testing is not just to um, help us find a clinical trial it can also help patients find the treatment that the, that standard of care treatment that they're going to use today can you talk about the difference and if you know when the patient's talking to their physician how do they know are they should they be in a clinical trial or should they have that standard of care so, so at least in, in yeah, at least in our case, um, you know, the, the one of the nice things about that molecular testing, that, that genomic testing, is that very often that will come with a list of trials that match to those particular alterations. So some of the work is done for the physician or the patient um, by the, the diagnostic company that runs those particular tests. So that's a good, a good place to start. Um, but, and then there are also, there's really kind of three, I guess, three categories of drugs that if you have a molecular alteration, one is it can be already approved and that means, you know, everything's been tested. You know that that's exactly the right thing to give that person and it's been tested in, in that disease and that that's, that's terrific. Um, if it's, it may still be in testing. So it may be, it, in that case, the only way to get it is a clinical trial, is to actually enroll in that clinical trial to get that drug. And then there's also a category called off-label use of a drug. So it's been, and this happens pretty often in pancreatic cancer, it's been approved in another cancer, for instance, in lung cancer, but it's not approved in pancreatic cancer and it's not approved in a tissue agnostic <laughs> and where, where it's based only on the biomarker either. But there are times when the physician can decide that's the right thing for this patient and can get, in essence, can treat that patient with that particular drug. It's best to to get that information, to do it. If you can do it in a clinical trial, we will learn more <laughs> if you do it through a clinical trial. But it is possible to get those drugs in that off-label situation as well. Um, so there really are um, kind of a, a range of, of alternates. So it sounds like that conversation with the physician is of critical importance, whether you are going to have them help you find the right treatment in this moment with what's available, whether you are going to ask for help to navigate to a clinical trial, or like you said, Lynn, um, talking about this off-label discussion, which I think is is um, comes as a surprise to lots of patients who aren't aware that, that it's an option. So really starting with the physician, the care team, your nurse, having those conversations and saying, you know, what's right for me? What are my options. And Andrea, back to your point, um, going and getting second opinions, because if you can, one person may not know all the options, right? So making sure that you, you're you giving getting as much information as you possibly can. Yeah. And I think uh, the other thing too, Elizabeth, and, and you know, the, the resources are out there. 
So if you're looking for a specialist, I know, you know, many of the organizations have either specialist maps because there are people who specialize in certain types of lung cancer or pancreatic cancer in the country where you can go to get a second opinion or to ask the question. Um, and then there are also, you know, navigators and others who can help you get to that right resource. Yeah, excellent point. So in a perfect world, all of us who are at risk of cancer, who get cancer, who have cancer progress, we get all of the information we need, we make excellent choices, and we have access to the, the most innovative care, right? That's perfect. But we don't live in a perfect yeah. world. So we know that there are lots of barriers. What are, and Andrea, I'll start with you in lung cancer, what are some of the barriers that patients experience when they go to get biomarker testing? Wow, um, where to even begin on that one? I, I think there, there are, at the patient level, at the provider level, and at the system level, there are kind of barriers along the entire trajectory, if you will. Um, and so, you know, at the person level, I think um, some of the barriers are lack of awareness, lack of education. The information now, I mean, we're translating a lot of materials into health literate um, forms as well as into other languages as well. So it's not a lot of very complex medical jargon that's being thrown at somebody, but actually just the essentials of what it is that you need to know. Um, I think that that's also helpful for too many providers who treat are generalists, they're not specialists. So they have to keep track of a lot of cancers that are changing rapidly and information. So it's important to educate at the provider level. That's another barrier, awareness and just education. Um, at the systems level, I think it's um, uh, payment, access to the drugs, requirements for things like prior authorization and other sort of very, um, you know, payer related uh, barriers that exist. Um, I think that they're at the systems level, again, you know, they're everything from the complexities. This is, um, it happens to a patient, but it's not a patient problem necessarily. Everything from is enough tissue being taken out of your body in order to do all the testing that's required tissue acquisition right huge barrier because if they don't take enough you got to go back in for a second biopsy sometimes that's possible sometimes it's not everything too is the tissue being handled the proper way once it comes out of your body to when it gets to the lab so that they can run the tests on it all of these the science is changing so quickly that i think the rest of the systems are kind of struggling to keep up a little bit in some respects mm -hmm. and to catch up and just to make sure that it happens. So I think there are barriers along the way, but the, the important thing is I really think they're addressable and I really think that it's starting to happen. Um, and so this, you know, while it, yet right now we're sort of at an inflection point, I think, you know, five or 10 years down the road, hopefully we won't be having this conversation quite honestly. Yeah, and it's it speaks to the incredible importance of advocacy. And I know that uh, Longevity and PanCan and Cancer Support Community, we work together quite a bit on advocacy yep. efforts. And it's it's incredibly important um, for individual patients to understand that your story matters, that when you yes. talk about those barriers that you face, that helps us to be able to go speak to members of Congress, to be able to speak to decision makers and say, this isn't good enough, right? We want patients to be able to navigate the system and get the best care. So. Um, Lynn, do you find some of the same barriers with um, patients dealing with pancreatic cancer? Yeah, we do. We have a, a maybe a, um, a, a higher barrier with just the general idea of precision medicine, I think, in, in, in pancreatic cancer. It is, we don't have as many drugs that are approved specifically for pancreatic cancer in this field. Um, it's a relatively rare cancer type. Um, and so the, the, you know, a general oncologist will see maybe four or five people a year with pancreatic cancer, and they don't necessarily think about, um, oh, I should get molecular testing on, on this person, on these people. Um, so we find that it's really important. Um, we tell people to, to call PanCan, um, call our helpline and mm -hmm. learn about, about it. Um, we have a program called Know Your Tumor Program, which is where we facilitate um, people getting molecular testing if it's not being offered and make sure that they're asking for it, but that, that we mm -hmm. can help if, if it's not being offered to them. Um, and so it's, um, you know, kind to, there's lots of 
um, as, as Andrea said, there's barriers all along the way um, for this, and it takes different approaches to, to try to break, break down all those barriers. But one thing that is really important is, is for the, the patient to at least be aware of, of these possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that both of you have said many times is just how quickly the science is evolving here. So I wanna ask you to get out your crystal ball and in five to 10 years, let's fingers crossed, hope we are out of a pandemic, right? We're not thinking about COVID anymore. <laughs> so we're out of the pandemic. Um, biomarker testing has evolved and changed. And what is the patient experience like? How much has changed? What do you think this is gonna look like in five to 10 years? And Andrea, I'll ask you first. Five to 10 years, Crystal Ball, I would say, um, you know, I, I'd love to say lung cancer is cured or cancer is cured, but uh, as we know, this is the 50th anniversary for the war on cancer. So, um, you know, we'll it takes time. It takes time. But from a particularly from a biomarker and from the lung cancer patient experience, I would say that when anyone is diagnosed with lung cancer, um, particularly non-small cell lung cancer, because there are different types of lung cancer, mm -hmm. but they go in and it is just done automatically reflexively where they have their biopsy it is sent off to a lab they automatically do a full panel um, of tests to understand what's driving the cancer what's um you know what, what is made up of uh, and it comes back and before a person has their first appointment with their oncologist that they have all of that information at their fingertips so that they can have an informed conversation with their doctor and be put on the right treatment or quite honestly the way the disease is going right now cocktail of treatments that can um, not only um, stop the progression of their current disease but also then stop other resistance things from popping up as well and i do think in five or ten years that's a realistic um hope if you will yeah so it'll be the expectation you you go to the doc and that's what what you should be able to expect i would think so yeah yeah lynn what about you what do you think Oh, I love it. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, I think we're, we're pancreatic cancer is slightly behind, but I think in five or 10 years, we'll be there too. And um, it'll just be reflexive that on that first diagnostic biopsy to get enough tissue to learn what you can about um, and to the treatment course for that particular patient. I think that is, um, I think that's absolutely doable. Yeah, that's great. That gives me hope. It's a good thing. I hope those crystal balls are reading reading correctly today. So, um, well, we, we've talked about a ton of different information, and I just want to remind folks who are watching today on Facebook, who watch um, in the archive, that the Cancer Support Community has a great helpline. We have lots of educational materials. You can contact us, look at our website, cancersupportcommunity.org, or our helpline at 888-793-9355. But I also know, as you've heard today, that Longevity and PanCan have extraordinary resources too. So I wanted to ask is if, um, Lynn, you mentioned the helpline, what else does PanCan have to offer patients who might have questions? Yeah, so, so we do believe in the right track, which is something that um, a number of, of advocacy organizations have worked together to, uh, to define in, in, um, in um, terms that we can then use across the field. But that means the right team. So yes, see a specialist, I think in particular in pancreatic cancer, since it, it is, it's is still relatively rare. It, you know, people who are very experienced with the disease um, often know some of the tricks that, that other um, individuals may not, and that that's important to have the right team to get the right tests to get in pancreatic cancer, both genetic testing and biomarker testing of your tumor tissue. Um, they both give important information um, and then get the right treatment and especially consider clinical trials all along the way. Um, we also say share your data. Um, we can learn from uh, people's experience. So there's many ways to share your data. 
um, share your information and your experiences that will um, could very well help the patients of the future. So those are um, kind of following the right track is uh, is something that, and we do have a helpline and it gives individual support um, and information. So wherever you are along that journey, um, you know, and whatever those questions are, why we have people that can, that can help you give you those answers. And Lynn, if, if patients call your helpline and they want to be connected to a clinical trial, um, you mentioned the, the clinical trial matching service. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah, we keep an up to date database of the pancreatic cancer clinical trials that are open in the US and we call around on a on a monthly basis and say, are you still open? Are you taking patients? Are you so that we know that when we're giving information um, that it's as accurate as it can be as to whether that clinical trial is available or, or not. And then we do our best to match it to the stage of disease. What are the, 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 what they call the eligibility requirements for those particular trials. We try to get, um, we don't want to give patients information for things they aren't eligible for. Sure. Um, we try to give them a, a list of things that we think would, that they would be, um, that they could consider. And mm -hmm. then we ask them to take that to their doctor because really their doctor knows the, the next level of detail that can mm -hmm. help them um, narrow down and determine um, which trials are really could be best for them and then try to provide whatever support we can to um, to actually help them get on that trial um, but that is you know the first the first place to start is to say what's out there yeah. um, what's out there that might be relevant for me and then to give them yes a list of questions that they can ask their doctor and say you know consider this please consider yeah. this that's great. That's incredible sort of wraparound service to make sure that if there's a trial out there, the patient can find it and, and hopefully be able to access it, Lynn. So thank you to PanCan for that for that service. Um, and Andrea, Longevity does extraordinary work too. Can you talk about some of the resources that you offer to lung cancer patients and their families? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, like uh, PanCan, we too are part of the right track in, in its uh, inception and, and delivery as well, but also just the, the methodology and process. But in terms of services, we too have a helpline. It's on the website. Um, the, it's a very comprehensive website also, so strongly encourage anybody diagnosed with lung cancer to visit. There are education materials. There are downloadable questions to ask. There's connectivity to uh, patient communities and resources. We also recently launched uh, the patient gateways uh, with KRAS being the first one, which has a specialist map as well as curated information feeds on different types of lung cancer. So I think that it's a very rich um, resource for people. Um, and then obviously the clinical trial matching and tools available as well. Um, similarly, we have patient meetups, which are um, moderated by an oncology nurse that we have on staff, um, just to answer your questions, as well as very rich um, virtual and social media. Uh, opportunities also. So it kind of runs the gamut, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, most of the information is there and certainly we're all available as well for to answer questions and to help. And we've all had to learn how to deliver these services virtually over the last year, yes, which is one of the few silver linings, right? That we're able to provide more services to more people than ever before, because we all can do it sitting in front of our computer. And by all, I mean, people who have access and we're, we're working to help make sure that as many people have access as possible. Yeah. I think it's hugely important because, you know, it, many of our diseases that we represent, they're very isolating diseases and people don't always avail themselves of in-person things, but virtually they can, you know, and it, or they're too sick to travel or other things. And I think it's it is one of the silver linings. Absolutely. It's um, it's important to pull out some silver lining from from the last couple of years. So I know um, we've served more patients than ever. And I know that, that the same goes for for almost every cancer organization at this point. Yep. Well, I'm looking at the time and we're coming close to the end of our hour together. It passed very quickly. I learned a ton from both of you, as I always do when you speak. Um, but I just want to ask, is there any sort of last thoughts, last um, ideas that you would leave with patients as they're thinking about biomarker testing? And I'll, Lynn, I'll start with you this time. I think knowledge is power. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the more that the, the patient 
doesn't have to be a molecular biologist, but they have to understand that there's information in both their their genes, <laughs> their inherited genes, as well as the tumor itself. The tumor can give us information. And that um, making sure that people who can interpret that information are, <laughs> are available to them, that, that they ask those questions, that they advocate for themselves. Um, and, you know, in the case of pancreatic cancer, call PanCan because we'll help you um, figure out what, <laughs> what questions you should ask. Absolutely. Thank you. Andrea? No, I, I think that's very well said, and, and I do think knowledge is power, and I think that it's really important for people to um, educate themselves, and if they don't want to, to find somebody else who can be educated on their behalf, necessarily. Um, and one of the resources that I was remiss in not mentioning is um, the noonemiss.org website that we have, which is solely focused around biomarker testing, but it has great resources like how do you read your test report? What does this mean to me? You know, in all of the, in very um, straightforward language so that you can un understand it. Um, but absolutely um, be sure to uh, inform yourselves, have full knowledge before making treatment decisions um, and at a minimum, ask the right questions. Yep, absolutely. Knowledge is absolutely power. And I think it's incredibly important to also understand that you don't have to do it by yourself, right? No. You've got organizations like longevity like pancan like cancer support community and and virtually any cancer that you may be diagnosed with there's an organization that can help you um and so we're here our helplines are here um you don't need to navigate this alone because it is so complex and so while knowledge is power just also know that you can tap into these incredible advocates like lynn and like andrea and and all of our colleagues across the spectrum who are offering these extraordinary resources so um with that i just want to uh, again andrea Andrea, Lynn, thank you so much. You're extraordinary advocates. Longevity Foundation and PanCan are wonderful organizations available to pancreatic cancer patients, lung cancer patients and their families. The cancer support community is always available for, for anybody impacted by cancer and all of us provide our services for free. So it, there should not be a barrier to accessing our services. We're here for you. Um, and again, ladies, just thank you so much. Thank you to LabCorp Oncology today for making this possible. It's been my pleasure to have everyone join us for this conversation. And if you have any questions about making treatment decisions, biomarker testing, or anything else we've discussed today or generally about cancer, please connect with our experienced and licensed navigators at our Cancer Support Helpline. That number again is 888 seven nine three nine three five five and our website is cancer support community.org and um andrea and lynn do you want to put a plug for your websites before we sign off i want to make sure that people know how to reach you so andrea how do they find longevity so longevity is similar to yourselves elizabeth it's www.longevity.org perfect and lynn and we, Pancreatic Cancer Action Network is too much of a mouthful, so it's PANCAN, P-A-N-C-A-N dot org. Well, one day maybe we'll be CSC dot org, but not yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, ladies, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody that, um, that joined us today. Have a great thank afternoon. You.